Welcome to the Ardent Archives, a ministry of North Clay Baptist Church. Here we explore the writings of church history in order to edify and equip the saints in their ongoing discipleship. In this series, we are reading and discussing Augustine and the Pelagian Controversy by B.B. Warfield. Written in the late 1800s, Warfield's informative work explores the relevance of Augustine's opposition to the Pelagian heresy. The primary issue for Augustine in the controversy that ensued at the beginning of the 5th century was the nature of man's will and the necessity of God's grace. So sit back and prepare to have your heart and mind engaged as we dive into Augustine and the Pelagian Controversy by B.B. Warfield. Part 4. The Theology of Grace the theology which Augustine opposed in his anti-Pelagian writings to the errors of Pelagianism is shortly the theology of grace. Its roots were planted deeply in his own experience and in the teachings of Scripture, especially of that apostle whom he delights to call the great preacher of grace, and to follow whom, in his measure, was his greatest desire. The grace of God in Jesus Christ conveyed to us by the Holy Spirit and evidenced by the love that he sheds abroad in our hearts is the center around which this whole side of his system revolves and the germ out of which it grows. He was the more able to make it thus central because of the harmony of this view of salvation with the general principle of his whole theology which was theocentric and revolved around his conception of God as the eminent and vital spirit in whom all things live and move and have their being. In like manner, God is the absolute good, and all good is either himself or from him, and only as God makes us good are we able to do anything good. The necessity of grace to man, Augustine argued from the condition of the race as partakers of Adam's sin. God created man upright and endowed him with human faculties, including free will, and gave to him freely that grace by which he was able to retain his uprightness. Being thus put on probation with divine aid to enable him to stand if he chose, Adam used his free choice for sinning and involved his whole race in his fall. It was on account of this sin that he died physically and spiritually, and this double death passes over from him to us, that all his descendants by ordinary generation are partakers in Adam's guilt and condemnation. Augustine is sure from the teachings of Scripture, and this is the fact of original sin, from which no one generated from Adam is free and from which no one is freed save as regenerated in Christ. But how we are made partakers of it, he is less certain. Sometimes he speaks as if it came by some mysterious unity of the race, so that we were all personally present in the individual Adam, and thus the whole race was the one man that sinned. Sometimes he speaks more in the sense of modern realists, as if Adam's sin corrupted the nature, and the nature now corrupts those to whom it is communicated. Sometimes he speaks as if it were due to simple heredity. Sometimes, again, as if it depended on the presence of shameful concupiscence in the act of procreation. So that the propagation of guilt depends on the propagation of offspring by means of concupiscence. However transmitted, it is yet a fact that sin is propagated, and all mankind became sinners in Adam. The result of this is that we have lost the divine image, though not in such a sense that no lineaments of it remain to us. And the sinning soul make the flesh corruptible. Our whole nature is corrupted, and we are unable to do anything of ourselves truly good. This includes, of course, an injury to our will. Augustine, writing for the popular I, treats this subject in popular language. 
But it is clear that he distinguished in his thinking between will as a faculty and will in a broader sense. As a mere faculty, will is and always remains in an indifferent thing. After the fall, as before it, continuing poised in indifferency, and ready, like a weathercock, to be turned whithersoever the breeze that blows from the heart. May direct. It is not the faculty of willing, but the man who makes use of that faculty that has suffered change from the fall. In paradise, man stood in full ability. He had the passe non precare, but not yet the non passe precare. That is, he was endowed with a capacity for either part and possessed the grace of God by which he was able to stand if he would, but also the power of free will by which he might fall if he would. By his fall, he has suffered a change, is corrupt and under the power of Satan. His will, in the broader sense, is now injured, wounded, diseased, enslaved. Although the faculty of will, in the narrow sense, remains indifferent. Augustine's criticism of Pelagius's discrimination of capacity, will, and act does not turn on the discrimination itself, but on the incongruity of placing the power, ability, in the mere capacity or possibility, rather than in the living agent who wills and acts. He himself adopts an essentially similar distribution, with only this correction, and thus keeps the faculty of will indifferent, but places the power of using it in the active agent, man. According, then, to the character of this man, will the use of the free will be okay? If the man be holy, he will make a holy use of it, and if he be corrupt, he will make a sinful use of it. If he be essentially holy, he cannot, like God himself, make a sinful use of his will, and if he be enslaved to sin, he cannot make a good use of it. The last is the present condition of men by nature. They have free will. The faculty by which they act remains is indifferency, and they are allowed to use it just as they choose. But such as they cannot desire and therefore cannot choose anything but evil, and therefore they, and therefore their choice, and therefore their willing, is always evil and never good. They are thus the slaves of sin, which they obey. And while their free will avails for sinning, it does not avail for doing any good unless they be first freed by the grace of God. It is undeniable that this view is in consonance with modern psychology. Let us once conceive of the will as simply the whole man in the attitude of willing, and it is immediately evident that however abstractly free the will is, it is conditioned and enslaved in all its action by the character of the willing agent. A bad man does not cease to be bad in the act of willing, and a good man remains good even in his acts of choice. In its nature, grace is assistance, help from God, and all divine aid may be included under the term, as well what may be called natural as what may be called spiritual aid. Spiritual grace includes, no doubt, all external help that God gives man for working out his salvation, such as the law, the preaching of the gospel, the example of Christ, by which we may learn the right way. It includes also forgiveness of sins, by which we are freed from the guilt already incurred. But above all, it includes that help which God gives us by His Holy Spirit, working within, not without, by which man is enabled to choose and to do what he sees, by the teaching of the law, or by the gospel, or by the natural conscience to be right. Within this aid are included all those spiritual exercises which we call regeneration, justification, perseverance to the end, in a word, all the divine assistance by which, in being made Christians, we are made to differ from other men. 
Augustine is fond of representing this grace as, in essence, the writing of God's law or of God's will on our hearts so that it appears hereafter as our own desire and wish, and even more prevalently as the shedding abroad of love in our hearts by the Holy Ghost given to us in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as a change of disposition, by which we come to love and freely choose, in cooperation with God's aid, just the things which hitherto we have been unable to choose because in bondage to sin. Grace thus does not make void free will. It acts through free will and acts upon it only by liberating it from its bondage to sin, by liberating the agent that uses the free will so that he is no longer enslaved by his fleshly lusts and is enabled to make use of his free will in choosing the good. And thus it is only by grace that free will is enabled to act in good part. But just because grace changes the disposition and so enables man, hitherto slave to sin, for the first time to desire and use his free will for good, it lies in the very nature of the case that it is prevenient. Also, as the very name imports, it is necessarily gratuitous. Since man is enslaved to sin until it is given, all the merits that he can have prior to it are bad merits and deserve punishment, not gifts of favor. When, then, it is asked on the ground of what grace is given, it can only be answered on the ground of God's infinite mercy and undeserved favor. There is nothing in man to merit it, and it first gives merit of good to man. All men alike deserve death, and all that comes to them in the way of blessing is necessarily of God's free and unmerited favor. This is equally true of all grace. It is preeminently clear of that grace which gives faith, the root of all other graces which is given of God, not to merits of good will or incipient turning to him, but of his sovereign good pleasure. But equally with faith, it is true of all other divine gifts, we may indeed speak of merits of good as succeeding faith. But as all these merits find their root in faith, they are but grace on grace, and men need God's mercy always. Throughout this life and even on the judgment day itself, when, if they are judged without mercy, they must be condemned. If we ask, then, why God gives grace, we can only answer that it is of His unspeakable mercy. And if we ask why He gives it to one rather than to another, what can we answer but that it is of His will? The sovereignty of grace results from its very gratuitousness. Where none deserve it, it can be given only of the sovereign good pleasure of the great giver. And this is necessarily inscrutable, but cannot be unjust. We can faintly perceive, indeed, some reasons why God may be supposed not to have chosen to give His saving grace to all, or even to the most. But we cannot understand why He has chosen to give it to just the individuals to whom He has given it, and to withhold it from just those from whom He has withheld it. Here we are driven to the Apostle's cry, O oh, the depth of of the riches both of the mystery and the justice of God. The effects of grace are according to its nature. Taken as a whole, it is the recreative principle sent forth from God for the recovery of man from his slavery to sin and for his reformation in the divine image. Considered as to the time of its giving, it is either operating or cooperating grace either the grace that first enables the will to choose the good or the grace that cooperates with the already enabled will to do the good. And it is, therefore, also called either prevenient or subsequent grace. It is not to be conceived of as a series of disconnected divine gifts, but as a constant efflux from God. 
but we may look upon it in the various steps of its operation in men as bringing forgiveness of sins, faith, which is the beginning of all good, love to God, progressive power of good working, and perseverance to the end. In any case, and in all its operations alike, just because it is power from on high and the living spring of a new and recreated life, it is irresistible and indefectible. Those on whom the Lord bestows the gift of faith, working from within, not from without, of course have faith and cannot help believing. Those to whom perseverance to the end is given must persevere to the end. It is not to be objected to this, that many seem to begin well who do not persevere. This also is of God, who has in such cases given great blessings indeed, but not this blessing of perseverance to the end. Whatever of good men have that God has given, and what they have not, why, of course, God has not given it. Nor can it be objected that this leaves all uncertain. It is only unknown to us. But this is not uncertainty. We cannot know that we are to have any gift which God sovereignly gives, of course, until it is given. And we therefore cannot know that we have perseverance unto the end until we actually persevere to the end. But who would call what God does and knows he is to do uncertain, and what man is to do certain. Nor will it do to say that thus nothing is left for us to do. No doubt all things are in God's hands, and we should praise God that this is so, but we must cooperate with him, and it is just because it is he that is working in us the willing and the doing that it is worth our while to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God has not determined the end without determining the appointed means. Now, Augustine argues, since grace certainly is gratuitous and given to no preceding merits, provenient and antecedent to do all good, and therefore sovereign and bestowed only on those whom God selects for its reception, we must, of course, believe that the eternal God has foreknown all this from the beginning. He would be something less than God had he not foreknown that he intended to bestow this provenient, gratuitous, and sovereign grace on some men, and had he not foreknown equally the precise individuals on whom he intended to bestow it. To foreknow is to prepare beforehand, and this is predestination. He argues that there can be no objection to predestination, in itself considered in the mind of any man who believes in a God. What men object to is the gratuitous and sovereign grace to which no additional difficulty is added by the necessary assumption that it was foreknown and prepared for from eternity. That predestination does not proceed on the foreknowledge of good or of faith follows from its being nothing more than the foresight and preparation of grace, which, in its very idea, is gratuitous and not according to any merits, sovereign and according only to God's purpose, provenient and in order to faith and good works. It is the sovereignty of grace, not its foresight or the preparation for it, which places men in God's hands and suspends salvation absolutely on his unmerited mercy. But just because God is God, of course, no one receives grace who has not been foreknown and afore selected for the gift. And, as much of course, no one who has been foreknown and afore selected for it fails to receive it. Therefore, the number of the predestined is fixed, and fixed by God. Is this fate? Men may call God's grace fate if they choose, but it is not fate, but undeserved love and tender mercy without which none would be saved. Does it paralyze effort? Only to those who will not strive to obey God because obedience is his gift. 
Is it unjust? Far from it. Shall not God do what he will with his own undeserved favor? It is nothing but gratuitous mercy, sovereignly distributed and foreseen and provided for from all eternity by him who has selected us in his Son. When Augustine comes to speak of the means of grace, of the channels and circumstances of its conference to men, he approaches the meeting point of two very dissimilar streams of his theology, his doctrine of grace and his doctrine of the church. And he is sadly deflected from the natural course of his theology by the alien influence. He does not, indeed, bind the conference of grace to the means in such a sense that the grace must be given at the exact time of the application of the means. He does not deny that God is able, even when no man rebukes, to correct whom he will, and to lead him on to the wholesome mortification of repentance by the most hidden and most mighty power of his medicine. Though the gospel must be known in order that man may be saved, for how shall they believe without a preacher? Yet the preacher is nothing, and the preachment is nothing but God only that gives the increase. He even has something like a distant glimpse of what has since been called the distinction between the visible and invisible church. Speaking of men not yet born us among those who are called according to God's purpose, and therefore of the saved who constitute the church, asserting that those who are so called even before they believe are already children of God enrolled in the memorial of their father with unchangeable surety and at the same time allowing that there are many already in the visible church who are not of it and who can therefore depart from it but he teaches that those who are thus lost out of the visible church are lost because of some fatal flaw in their baptism or on account of post-baptismal sins, and that those who are of the called according to the purpose are predestinated not only to salvation, but to salvation by baptism. Grace is not tied to the means in the sense that it is not conferred save in the means, but it is tied to the means in the sense that it is not conferred without the means. Baptism, for instance, is absolutely necessary for salvation. No exception is allowed except such as save the principle baptism of blood, martyrdom, and somewhat grudgingly baptism of intention. And baptism, when worthily received, is absolutely efficacious. If a man were to die immediately after baptism, he would have nothing at all left to hold him liable to punishment. In a word, while there are many baptized who will not be saved, there are none saved who have not been baptized. It is the grace of God that saves, but baptism is a channel of grace without which none receive it. The saddest corollary that followed from this doctrine was that by which Augustine was forced to assert that all those who died unbaptized, including infants, are finally lost and depart into eternal punishment. He did not shrink from the inference, although he assigned the place of the lightest punishment in hell to those who were guilty of no sin but original sin. But who had departed this life without having washed this away in the laver of regeneration? This is the dark side of his soteriology, but it should be remembered that it was not his theology of grace, but the universal and traditional belief in the necessity of baptism for remission of sins, which he inherited in common with all of his time, that forced it upon him. The theology of grace was destined in the hands of his successors, who have rejoiced to confess that they were taught by him to remove this stumbling block also from Christian teaching. And if not to Augustine, it is to Augustine's theology that the Christian world owes its liberation from so terrible and incredible a tenet. Along with the doctrine of infant damnation, another stumbling block also, not so much of Augustinian, but of church theology, has gone. It was not because of his theology of grace or of his doctrine of predestination that Augustine taught that comparatively few of the human race are saved. 
It was again because he believed that baptism and incorporation into the visible church were necessary for salvation. And it is only because of Augustine's theology of grace, which places man in the hands of an all-merciful Savior and not in the grasp of a human institution, that men can see that the salvation of all who die in infancy, the invisible church of God, embraces the vast majority of the human race, saved not by the washing of water administered by the church, but by the blood of Christ administered by God's own hand outside of the ordinary channels of His grace. We are indeed born in sin, and those that die in infancy are, in Adam, children of wrath, even as others. But God's hand is not shortened by the limits of his church on earth, that it cannot save. In Christ Jesus, all souls are the Lord's, and only the soul that itself sinneth shall die. And the only judgment wherewith men shall be judged proceeds on the principle that as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned under law shall be judged by the law. Thus, although Augustine's theology had a very strong churchly element within it, it was, on the side that is presented in the controversy against Pelagianism, distinctly anti-ecclesiastical. Its central thought was the absolute dependence of the individual on the grace of God in Jesus Christ. It made everything that concerned salvation to be of God and traced the source of all good to Him. Without me, ye can do nothing, is the inscription on one side of it. And on the other stands written, All things are yours. Augustine held that he who builds on a human foundation builds on sand and founded all his hope on the rock itself. And there also he founded his teaching. As he distrusted man in the manner of salvation, so he distrusted him in the form of theology. No other of the fathers so conscientiously wrought out his theology from the revealed word. No other of them so sternly excluded human additions. The subjects of which theology treats, he declares, are such as we could by no means find out unless we believe them on the testimony of the Holy Scripture. Where Scripture gives no certain testimony, he says, human presumption must beware how it decides in favor of either side. We must first bend our necks to the authority of Scripture, he insists, in order that we may arrive at knowledge and understanding through faith. And this was not merely his theory, but his practice. No theology was ever, it may be more broadly asserted, more conscientiously wrought out from the Scriptures. Is it without error? No. But its errors are on the surface, not of the essence. It leads to God, and it came from God. And in the midst of the controversies of so many ages, it has shown itself an edifice whose solid core is built out of material which cannot be shaken. Yeah.